Hi guys! Thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we are going to take a look at the pistols of Charola y Anichua. This is one of the early Spanish semi-automatic pistol manufacturers, and they made this really quite distinctive looking gun that appears to be a cute tiny version of the C96 Brumandle Mauser. And mechanically it actually sort of is. So this uh, originates, originally this was actually um, Anichua y Charola, the order of the names reversed, and they existed at least as early as 1888. At that point they were actually registered with the Spanish government uh, in the census as a workshop with 39 employees. And at that point they were manufacturing pretty good copies of the Merwin and Hulbert revolvers. And that lasted for a little while. Uh, ultimately in 1898 uh, they reorganized and switched the name around. It appears that Ignacio Chirola was taking more of a, uh, a dominant role in the company. Uh, his partner, Miguel Anichua, uh, ended up as the second name in the company. And then in 1899 they started manufacturing these guys. Their little semi-auto pistol in 5mm Clement cartridge. So this was a cartridge that was in use uh, in a series of uh, mainland European pistols, the Clement pistols, and Charola y Anichua took that cartridge and used it in their pistol. So this is a total pipsqueak of a cartridge. Really, really tiny. Uh, they manufactured those for a year or two, and then in 1900 they kind of went through another reorganization. And uh, Miguel Anichua left the company, Ignacio Chirola took the whole enterprise over, and at that point he added a 7mm variety, which we have two of here, and started selling them as well. These would continue to sell until 1905, when the whole thing shut down, uh, went out of business. It's as far as I can tell. Uh, these were never particularly popular selling pistols, although they did end up making a total of about 8400 of them between the 5mm and the 7mm varieties. So uh, we are going to take a look at some of the variation between them, and we have one of the 5mm taken apart to show you the internals as well. So we'll start with the very first version. This is a Chirola Ianichua 5mm pistol, and uh, this one has some nice fancy grips on it. And these function rather like broom handle Mausers. So we have a short recoil system on top here that's going to recoil backward just that far. That unlocks the pistol. This is in fact a locked breech pistol. And then once it's unlocked the bolt comes back and it will actually lock open on the follower when it's empty. This has a six round capacity and it is fed by stripper clips like this one. So that fits right in there. And you would then strip the cartridges into the magazine, just like a broom handle Mauser. These have a manual safety on them, this big long tab on these early guns. And you snap it down and that locks the hammer in position, uh, either in the cocked position or if I drop the hammer, I can also engage the safety in uh, the hammer down position. So you'll see in a moment how that exactly works, but it's kind of cool to have there. We have little teeny sights, just like that, uh, pretty typical for this time period. As for markings, these early ones kind of have some of the, the better markings on them. There is a bit of decorative engraving that was kind of standard, and then C -E -C -H -Y -A. so that's Charola e Anichua, uh, Charola and Anichua. And then on the bottom we have Marca, Regist Marca Registrata. So that uh, marca registrata means that this is a pistol that was made for domestic Spanish production. Um, the export ones would have a slightly different marking. This is an export. Uh, I've taken some pieces out because we'll be taking this one apart in a moment. But on this one it's C-H-E-A and then trademark, so in English for export. There are a couple more markings on the top of the receiver and the barrel. Uh, right there it's a little hard to read but it says 5 millimeter. And this one is also difficult to read, but it says Pistola Automatica Patents Chirola y Anichua Abar. Abar being the location uh, in Spain where these were manufactured. So the two-tone on this is pretty typical. Uh, you will also find them entirely blued, but two-tone's not out of, uh, out of the line of possibility. So after the split between Chirola and Anichua, the markings would change a little bit. We have um, uh, Chirola would continue to manufacture 5mm guns even at the same time that he was making 7mm ones. So let's take a look at this. Here we have Marca Registrata, so this was a domestic sale pistol. 
to grips have this cool embossed uh, sort of belt emblem, uh, Sistema Shirola y Nichua. However, up on the barrel, we have just I Shirola, uh, A bar, caliber 5mm. And you can see a few differences between uh, these pistols. So the rear sight changed a bit. The safety lever on the later Shirola guns is much shorter. Um, I would presume that this turned out to be a little bit fragile and was easy to catch on things. The shorter safety does seem like it would make uh, a bit more sense. And the barrel length here is just slightly reduced. In an effort to avoid some of the problems of the really seriously underpowered 5mm Clement, uh, Shirola of course introduced guns in 7mm, so ooh, big. The markings at this point get a bit simpler. Uh, this one is just a plain trademark. The CHEA is now gone. We have just the simple word patent on the top, and now the name that they have trademarked is Best Shooting Pistol. So that's not optimistic at all, is it? Uh, but you'll find that on uh, these Shirola guns. There were also a few mechanical changes that took place. So the original 5mm guns have a retaining pin, or a retaining screw here, that prevents um, the firing pin from moving too far. That was uh, omitted on the 7mm guns. Instead, the 7mm guns have a keyed firing pin, kind of like a broom handle Mauser. In addition, the 7mm guns are serialized on the top of the bolt, where these guys are serialized on the bottom surface of the bolt, and the 7mm guns are in their own separate serial number range that started at 10,000. So we don't know the exact split between the production of 5s and 7s. It's probably about 50-50. And a bit later in production still, in order to again try to increase the marketability of the guns, Shirola introduced a detachable mag model. So instead of having to use stripper clips and a fixed magazine, you could now have detachable mags, which is definitely an improvement. You'll notice the gun still has stripper clip guides, so you can still reload it with, with your stripper clips. It is still optimistically marked Best Shooting Pistol and Patent. And it now has this little tiny winged bullet, almost certainly uh, intending to look like a Webley logo, and the word trademark inside. So this would have been an export gun. Alright, so these guns are old, and they have lots of little tiny parts in them, and they're a bit finicky. And so we took this one apart before we started filming, and I decided not to try and completely reassemble it um, before we showed it to you. So we've got it partially disassembled here. Um, and we'll go through the steps for disassembly in case you have your own and you would like to do it. The first thing um, I'm going to point out is removing the floor plate. There is a screw in the very front of the magazine well. Don't take the screw out. That screw is actually a spring-loaded catch, and you want to push it up towards the barrel. Once you push that screw up, you can then pull the magazine floor plate forward and remove it. If this doesn't move, consider loosening that screw, because someone else may have tightened it down at some point, assuming that it needed to be tight. Now the next step is to remove these two screws, and these are actually two-part screws. So uh, what you have is a short screw on this side that threads into a longer uh, female threaded pin on this side. Something like this. So take out the screw, and then push out the pin. You will also need to take the grips off. Uh, those just have one simple screw holding them in place. Uh, if you don't take those off, you will chip the grips when you attempt to disassemble the trigger assembly. So take the grips off. Take out these two screws, push out the pins. So we'll do that here. There we go. Pull that pin out. Now, what you can do is pretty slick. You can actually take this whole trigger assembly and grip frame out. If you look at these closely, you'll see that the receiver uh, is, well, that the trigger assembly and grip assembly is a separate unit inside the receiver. So if we just kind of work this. A little careful with it. It is finicky. There we go. And pieces fall off when you do this, so be careful with that. You don't want to have these things all get shaken loose, or you will have a heck of a time putting it back together. So the two screws and pins that you have taken out, one is the pivot for the hammer, and the other is the pivot for the locking block. So they're very important. 
If we take a look at this whole assembly, first off, you can now see how the safety works. When I engage the safety, I'm locking the hammer in place, so the hammer can't move. And if I lift that up, I can cock the hammer back. I'm not going to go all the way because it puts it under spring tension without the pivot pin. But you can see this second notch where the safety locks in, that's the safety position when the hammer is cocked. We have our locking block right here. These two lugs lock into two matching lugs on the underside of the barrel. You can see those right there, and when I pull the bolt back they will move. So what happens with this is, this is sitting in approximately this position, and the locking block is pushed forward like this, under tension from this flat spring. When the gun fires, the whole upper assembly recoils backward like that, and that is enough to push this downward. That disengages its locking lugs from the bolt, and at that point the bolt can cycle open. Now the bolt has its own recoil spring inside here, uh, very much like a C96, and, uh, and that is kept captive by this plug. This is, again, very similar to a C96. So in theory you should be able to tap that plug out, and then, well, you take, take the screw out, then the firing pin comes out, then you tap this plug out, it comes out, and then the recoil spring comes out the back. Um, when we went to do that on this particular example we had trouble getting this plug out, and we decided uh, discretion would be the better part of valor, and we would just leave it alone. Because even without taking that apart you can see how everything works here. Going back to the trigger mechanism for a moment, uh, you can see we have the trigger, transfer bar, sear, and hammer. There is this flat spring that gives just a little bit of tension to the sear and the transfer bar, and then this coil spring for the trigger. So when I pull the trigger, it's going to push this transfer bar forward, which is going to tip this sear. That sear would normally be engaging in that little notch in the hammer when the gun is cocked. When I pull the trigger all the way through, it slips off right here, and that is the disconnector. So because that slips off, it only allows the gun to fire once, and I have to release the trigger and allow it to reset before it can fire a second time. So that prevents it from being a machine gun. And uh, last little feature I guess, that is the ejector. Everything's pretty flat on that side. All the interesting stuff is going on over here. Uh, there is also a number on the locking block. So this particular gun is quite early, it's number 129. The other place you find that serial number is, you get the lighting right, uh, right down in there on the underside of the bolt. One last feature I can point out, this little flat uh, V-spring right here, that is the basically the return spring for the slide assembly. That spring is going to push up against this surface, and after the gun has recoiled it's going to push the slide back into battery like that. So there's a spring in the bolt uh, to move it, there's a V-spring to push the slide forward, and then there is also this flat spring to maintain a constant upward pressure on the locking block. Once you've taken one of these apart, reassembly isn't all that difficult, it is just a little bit finicky. Uh, you start by sliding this assembly back into the upper receiver, get it locked in place, put through your pins, and you do have to kind of fiddle with these to make sure that they, the pins go through the, the pivot holes properly, because all this stuff has a little bit of spring tension on it when you're doing it. And then you put the grips back on and you're basically uh, all set. While these were being manufactured, they did actually submit one of the 5mm varieties uh, to Spanish military testing. The Spanish military was looking for a, a new semi-automatic pistol sidearm for its officers. They would ultimately adopt the Campo Giro, uh, and then later a Bergman uh, instead. These were kicked out of the trials pretty darn quickly, because that cartridge just wasn't going to cut it for a military sidearm. Even for a pistol that was mostly a symbol of rank, that's still a little bit too wimpy. So um, what we are left with is a number, uh, a couple of different variations of commercially sold pistols. Very early guns, they're, they're one of these really cool designs from the period when people didn't know what was going to be particularly effective or popular, and so people experimented with a lot of different designs. Um, the one last one that I'll point out, I don't have an example here, but I am familiar with one. Uh, that was actually converted probably in Mexico to 25 ACP with a magazine spacer and 
that actually strikes me as a really cool little conversion, because it puts it in a cartridge that's still readily available today. Anyway, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video, hopefully you learned something new about a cool new Spanish pistol. If you are interested in more information on these guns, or other Spanish manufacturer firearms from the period, uh, the book I would strongly recommend as a reference is Astra Pistols and Selected Competitors by Leonardo Antares. Uh, it is a huge book, great photographs, and a ton of information. It is where I got the information mostly for this video, uh, and really can't be beat on the subject. So anyway, I'll have a link in the description text where you can pick up a copy of that if you're interested in it. Otherwise, thanks for watching, and stick around for another cool forgotten weapon tomorrow.